Hi, good afternoon, uh, colleagues. Uh, welcome, yeah, to the uh, Stellenbosch Forum uh, lecture series. We're very fortunate to have here Francis uh, Forrest, uh, who's the uh, founding director of the African Wildlife Economy Institute, an institute that we founded last year, in fact. Um, and uh, we're very excited about that. So Francis, welcome. It's nice to have you here. Um, and we're looking forward to what you have to share with us on wildlife and conservation in a sustainable, uh, in sustainable economic uh, development. So the floor is yours. Let's welcome him. Hi, this is a little bit more formal than I thought it would be. Can you hear me? Is this OK? Up, higher, higher, no? <laughs> OK, um, let me see if I can take this through. I'm going to try and be done talking as quick as I can, but no, if, no later than in 45 minutes so that some of you want to push off and do other things in your life can do that. And then I'll be around we can, for questions and answers informally. Um, the, I've put two uh, brands on the, on the first slides to show you some of the linkages that we're dealing, working on this topic. One is the African Wildlife Economy Institute here, which has been set up under the Faculty of Agri-Sciences. Um, yes, Agri-Sciences is the home to conservation ecology on campus, but it's also the home for all sustainable land management discussions, and wildlife economy is about um, land management. How do we manage the land for wild species and wild benefits out of those wild species? The other logo is the African Leadership University in Kigali, where I serve as the academic director on a part-time basis. And we have a school of wildlife conservation there where we don't do any ecology. We do conservation finance, conservation business, conservation law, conservation governance, and so on. And so in Kigali, we're, if you were looking at the human dimensions of conservation. So the two projects, from my viewpoint, what we're doing in Stellenbosch and what we're doing in Kigali are quite interlinked. We're here, the emphasis is more on impactful research, and there it's more on impactful training and education. Okay, so what I'm going to do is take you through a little bit of a journey on some words, and then that will show you how we've moved to the concept of wildlife economy. So if you will, this is sort of the sort of policy background to this whole idea of an institute looking at this concept of growing wildlife economies. And it comes out of um, a discussion in the Sustainable Development Goals, that's the SDG acronym there, in which there's a target to enhance policy coherence for sustainable development. And what we have now is we have not just policy incoherence between various themes, whether you're talking about gender or climate change or um, rural employment or um, education or youth and all those complex things. But we also have policy incoherence within the conservation sector between the Convention on Biological Diversity, the Convention on International Trade in Endangered Species, the Ramsar Convention, wetlands, and so on. Currently this week, we're in the second week of the CITES, which we'll talk quite a bit about the Convention on International Trade and Endangered Species, the second week of their Conference of the Parties in Geneva, in which basically our governments of the world are saying that we can't trade animals that we'd like to trade, like in this part of the world, trading elephants and rhino products. And that's incoherent with commitments that our governments have made to utilize wildlife sustainably under the Biodiversity Convention and so on. So to get an understanding of how we could start why we have this policy on coherence and how we can promote coherence, I'm suggesting we have to go back and start looking at the words and understanding that what these words mean or what they don't mean. So I'm looking very much at what do we mean by wildlife conservation and development in the context of international policy in this. So what's wildlife? What is conservation? What is sustainable economic development? How does the word wildlife relate to the word biodiversity? There's a new concept of natural capital. How does conservation relate to sustainable use, to restoration? Um, the line that I say about sustainable development is we know that poverty is sustainable. We as a species survive for many millions of years poor. Do we know if prosperity is sustainable? Now that we're getting wealthy, now that this continent is getting wealthy, do we know if that's sustainable? And if it is sustainable, is there any place for wildlife in a prosperous planet? Where do these animals live? So you'll see I, uh, the view we have is that the problems that our animals face is not about poverty in Africa, but it's about prosperity. Um, OK, so I'm going to take you through four agreements. Uh, um, 
statements, if you will. Two of them are conventions, 1975 CITES, 1992 at the Real Plus Zero CBD, and then two, if you will, strategies, the World Conservation Strategy of 1980, which was launched under IUCN, and the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development, which was launched at Real Plus 20 in 2015, um, which has the Sustainable Development Goals. In 1980, which is my favorite one, that's why it's one you probably haven't heard of, and see if you can find it on the web. It's there, but it's in the bowels of the IUCN website. You really have to hunt for it, and you'll find it somewhere. Um, that was, in a sense, our first sustainable development goals. It was written by IUCN with um, WWF and with UNEP, which the United Nations Environment Program, which was only five years old in 1980, and with UNESCO and FAO and so on. And in those days, it was these international agencies that would set this platform. And you'll see that, that that one still today, I think, is very relevant. So we start with the word wildlife, then I'll go to the word conservation and sustainable development and end up back in, at our institute in, in Stellenbosch. So you can start with looking at what wildlife means in dictionaries. So this is just a slide of diction, uh, dictionary definitions. And You'll see the closest we get is sort of wildlife is not domesticated. It's something that's in the wild. Maybe it's something that we hunt. Well, you have this problem that wildlife is defined as animals that live in the wild. Well, what is wild wilderness? What is wildlife? And none of the conventions actually define the word, but we use it all the time and increasingly use it. So that word is still a bit complicated. In CITES, the word wildlife isn't used. In 75, but wild fauna and flora are used. And then CITES attempts to regulate wild fauna and flora to prevent um, extinction if, it's in, if trade will cause extinction. Though in the current uh, COP, there was actually a proposal to stop the trade in mammoth ivory, even though that poor animal has been extinct for a long, long time. Somehow they were going to make it not endangered by stopping the trade, and so, but th that didn't go through. But they mentioned it only twice. They only mentioned the word wild twice, and it's in the title and it's in the convention, the word wild, but it's never defined. So even what is wild? So is a rhino farmed in South Africa a wild animal? Is an ostrich farmed in Utsorn a wild animal? Yeah, is it or isn't it? I just drove, I just took an Uber from my mother-in-law's in Durbanville and I went by all the little chicken farms there, you know, ugh, those poor things that lived there for 28 days and then they end up in Nando's. And, um, you know, okay, they're not wild, but are they any different than the ostrich? And if the ostrich, then you go to the lion and so on. So the word wild still we need to work on. 1980, now, the word wild five years later is used about 40 times in the wildlife, uh, in the world conservation strategy, strategy. Fish and other wildlife, now that becomes important. In an African context, a lot of people think of wildlife as four-legged creatures. But in the IUCN world, this is under IUCN, fish are part of wildlife. And so if you look at a country like Kenya, they're not allowed to use their four-legged wildlife, but the people on the coast can use the wildlife as long as it swims. And they can even bring in Americans in to hunt the wildlife. They have a big sport fish fishing industry in Kenya. So you can't hunt an elephant, but you can hunt a marlin. So fish is wildlife, and then the, the forest and the grazing. And then it, this um, strategy recognizes its importance in developing countries, and the last line even shows that it's important for big business, the world of wildlife and wild animals in, in the economy. So this is back in 1980, 40 years ago. The CBD, it disappears. It's not there. It's mentioned a couple times. This is the only time the words come up in the whole convention. So 1992, the concept of wildlife sort of leaves. And biodiversity isn't really about wildlife. It's, it's biodiversity before 1992 was living natural resources. That was the WWF IUCN term. It's not in the world, world uh, conservation strategy. There is no word biodiversity. But by 92, it's a word. And then the, it sort of disappears. So there's only this sort of thing of domesticated versus wild, and that's it. But wildlife as a concept sort of disappears. But in the 2030 agenda in 2015, it actually comes back in again. So there's this thing about protecting wildlife and about wild species and wild products and so on. So it's sort of interesting that we've been using this word in policy, but we still haven't quite sort of categorized what we mean by wild or wildlife, but it's, 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 we sort of know what it means, but not quite. 
So with the definition we're using here at Stellenbosch, this is the one we've made up, it includes undomesticated terrestrial and marine animals, plants, and other life forms, as well as the abiotic and biotic interactions that came from conservation ecology, I had to throw that in. Um, I don't know what it means, but it sounds good. Um, wildlife is linked to the habitats and ecosystems that are naturally lives. I'm an economist by training, so I don't know much about nature. I just, we look at the business side of it, if you will. So, but even with our definition, what is undomesticated? domesticated mean. That's sort of a cop-out. We haven't quite handled that. Terrestrial marine, I think, is important. I think it's a very important discourse in terrestrial and aquatic, if you want. And then the interplace between what do you mean by wildlife and what do you mean by wilderness. So is a, is a farmed ostrich then a domesticated animal and a ostrich in the Kruger Park a wild animal? So is the wildness then depend on the neighborhood they live in or is it the animal itself? So this we're still working on that word. Conservation, now what does that word mean? Now this is the one that's the big change over these 40 years that changes the discourse and I think in part has got us to where we are in CITES today, which is a mess in international policy of lots of policy incoherence. So it, words like this is dictionary definitions off the web, protection, preservation, management, restoration, management, and so on. The word management pops up a lot, which is quite interesting. CITES doesn't really talk about conservation. It uses the word once, where it talks about restoration and conservation of the species back in 75. But it then says that trade is allowed, look at the bold in the second part, such export would not be detrimental to the survival of that species. That's a scientific authority. So at this last COP right now that's going on, for example, IUCN put its scientific assessment of the proposals of Zambia, Zimbabwe, was it Botswana, Namibia, to downlist elephants and allow trade in elephant products. And IUCN's assessment was there was no scientific basis not to allow the trade. But then the people that did that assessment said, but there are other things to consider that we think like, will it encourage illegal trade, will it encourage poaching and this and that, which I then took exception to because these are scientists doing a scientific assessment, now talking about non-science things that they have no standing to, they have no training in or whatever. And I went and met with the head of our in policy last week and complained. And her response to me was very interesting. Oh yeah, CITES, I'm the head of global policy for IUCN, but that's what the species people do. We never deal with it. So even in IUCN, there's a policy disconnect. So the global policy director, who's a Rwandan lady, who's a great lady, she's on our board of, of Awe, she doesn't deal with CITES. CITES is done by these scientists who then speak on trade issues that they are out, out, of, out of competency for. But that's, that's an interesting, that's the closest you get, is that conservation, I guess, if it's not detrimental, it's okay. WCS now has a definition of conservation, which is brilliant, which is what we use with our institute here. Conservation is defined as the management of human use of the biosphere so that it may yield the greatest sustainable benefit to present generations while maintaining its potential to meet the needs and aspirations of future generations. Thus, conservation embraces preservation, maintenance, sustainable utilization, restoration, enhancement of the living environment. It's that aspect of management which ensures that utilization is sustainable. This is an incredibly interesting definition. This was a definition that came out in 1980. Some of the older conservationists in the room, this is in our DNA. This is how we see conservation. It's not how people see it today. It's changed. And you'll see why in the next couple of slides. But it's a very can I say the word anthropocentric approach? It's very much focused on conservation for our benefit, and it's got the sustainability in there for our kids' benefit, and it's got the use, and it's got the restoration, and so on. It's, it's a really, really powerful definition. Nobody at IUCN today knows about it. They don't even read it anymore. They, it's, it's disappeared, and you'll see why as we move on. So the, the World Conservation Strategy set off three conservation objectives, 1980. Maintain essential ecological processes and life support systems, preserve genetic diversity, and ensure the sustainable use, utilization of species and ecosystems. So conservation was all of that. So conservation just wasn't about protecting animals. It was about maintaining processes and systems, preserving diversity of genetic um, and, um, resources and use, importantly, and use of resources. So when I got into this, and I was lecturing at Vitz in the late 80s, 
Um, so I was a little bit past the 1980. And then the WCS 2.0 is called Caring for the Earth, and it came out in the early 90s. My gosh, up in John, this is it. This is, this is the way we do conservation. Well, it changes when we get to the CBD. So we'll see what happens in 92. So the CBD has conservation in there. They talk about conservation now, but now they're putting it as conservation and sustainable use. But you'll see that there's measures on both of them in that convention. The convention is brilliant. And I talked to, I was a big, big fan of the convention for years until I finally sort of realized we changed the language in the way that was really unfortunate. So conservation and sustainable use split. So in the World Conservation Strategy, the three objectives on the left were called conservation objectives. In the Convention on Biological Diversity, they become biodiversity objectives, of which the first one is conservation. And the second one is sustainable use. And the third one is fair and equitable sharing. It's almost the same language, but not quite. And actually what's on the left, the WCS, was the text for the CBD until the 23rd hour. In my country, came in and said, no, we have to separate conservation from sustainable use. We have our history of John Muir and Yosemite and our history of Adel Leopold and forestry and use. And those are two different things, they're two different constituencies, so we have to separate it. So it was the Americans insisted to, to redo, rejig it. And then they didn't ratify the bloody convention anyways. So they still haven't ratified it. So, and I've got this from people that were on the negotiating team from the Dutch, said yes, they were all gonna use the WCS. In fact, you can see lots of words in the CBD are taken word for word from the World Conservation Strategy. It's, I mean, it's actually whole phrases and everything. But here they subtly took use out of conservation. So conservation now becomes something not use, which means it's what, protection, it's preservation. So the word changes, and today people then, so now we're stuck with this language, and it's very interesting, and now it's objectives about biodiversity as opposed to objectives about conservation. We could go on and on about this, but then the fund that set, gets set up to support the CB, the Global Environment Facility, funds the first thing, conservation. It doesn't fund the second thing, sustainable use, and it puts 90% of its money from the early 1990s to today in systems of protected areas. So it's all about protected areas. It's not about use, it's not about economic benefit, it's about protection. So 2030 agenda sort of tries to bridge the gap and it comes and it puts the two words together all the time, most of the time. So it, it has in its big objectives, conserve and sustainably use oceans and seas. So the 23rd agenda is really powerful for us. And there's 17 goals of which two are really our goals, if you will, in the conservation world. The marine goal says conserve and sustainably use the oceans and the seas and blah, blah, which means you can go out and hunt the fish and eat them like they do in Kenya. So you can do, in fact, our major hunting operations on the planet are offshore their large scale you know, industrial hunting operations and huge sport hunting and so on. Goal 15 is a terrestrial one and it doesn't even say conservation, it says use, protect, restore and promote sustainable use of terrestrial ecosystems, sustainably manage and force, help biodiversity loss and so on. So the, this, the 2030 agenda comes back in more strongly with this language, which is very interesting. Now, Okay, how do we then, how are we doing time-wise? Okay, I'm kicked out here. So now let's, so we've done those two, and you see that there was a shift of CBD. It's, they've tried to sort of patch it up in, in, in the 2030 agenda, but it's not quite in people's mindset. So we've still got this conservation and use thing. So what about the concept of sustainable development? CITES actually for 75, before the concept existed, is pretty cool. Um, that these things must be protected for this and the generations to come, and so that's got the, the sustainability bit, and they recognize values, um, aesthetic, scientific, cultural, recreational, and economic points of view. So they recognize that species have value and those values need to be sustained. So that's, this is pre-sustainable development language. WCS is where the language was first used, before the Brundtland Commission. So IUCN launched a document on 
conservation and development, and they basically said conservation is blah, blah, what I just showed you. Development is blah, blah. You put the two together and you get sustainable development. So sustainable development is the conservation, it's a prerequisite. Our conservation of living resources is a prerequisite for sustainable development. For development to be sustainable, it must take account of social and ecological factors as well as economic ones of the living and non-living resource base. Conservation and sustainable development are mutually dependent, can be illustrated by the plight of the rural poor. We were just talking about that before we started here about Zimbabwe and, and the, the uh, community-based conservation and the dependence of rural communities on living natural resources. So 40 years ago, there was a vision of, you, of conservation and development in which use of nature was part of the whole vision. It wasn't sort of conservation and development and use and development. It was conservation with use, with management, with enhancement, with restoration, all combined. So conservation just wasn't about national parks. The CBD is all about sustainable development. It recognizes that economic and social development and poverty eradication are the first and overriding priorities. The, the one that I, um, it's, it's really is in the development world. It's a convention out of the real conference. So it's about development and the use of living resources, biodiversity in the development context. But as I said, separating out an action of conservation from an action of use. The one that I sort of get a kick on is 8A, which is the, the uh, article about in situ conservation. And it says, to promote environmentally and sound and sustainable development in areas adjacent to protected areas. Does that mean we don't have sustainable development in protected areas, only outside? So what are protected areas? Areas of not development, not sustainable, you know? And it's just, that's an interesting issue. Kruger now is producing meat. It should be producing meat. It has a whole lot of meat to produce. And it should be selling that meat. It should be producing tourism. And it does do that. So we got this idea, even in the CBD, that somehow there were areas that were protected from development and or form sustainability and areas that have development as opposed to looking at the areas that are protected as part of the sustainable development program, which are the conservation is part of economic opportunity, job creation, poverty alleviation, and so on. So the 2030 agenda, of course, is all about sustainable development, and it has in its vision sustainable consumption and production, sustainably managing natural resources, and so on, and it has its 17 goals, which I mentioned, and 169 targets, well, wow. which is um, ambitious. So tying them together, we commit to pursuing policy coherence in an enabling environment for sustainable development. That's language from the 2030 agenda. And then my question is, can we get policy coherence between our, even within our conservation community, between the CITES agreement, the, w, the World Conservation Strategy, which is still a real document, the CBD, the 23rd Agenda, and what if we then add to that UNCCD is the, is the Desertification Convention, um, Climate Convention, the World Heritage Center, which talks about recognizing areas of significant heritage, natural and cultural, the Ramsar Convention on Wetland, the Convention on Migratory Species, and importantly, in, in, from an economic perspective, the World Trade Organization, which is maybe where the trade needs, discourse needs to move from, the leaves to CITES arena and go into the WTO. So is there a place for wildlife conservation and sustainable development? We aren't even sure how conservation fits at the moment between our agreements. They're, they're working in parallel. They've come up with conflicting decisions. One says you should use for, for development. The other says no trade, no use. And so we've got a, a real challenge here. And one of the ideas with our institute is to sort of unpack this and work on this. So what's happening right now with CITES is a few countries, again, down here in the south of Africa, are saying, well, maybe we should pull out of this bloody convention. And you know, the president of uh, Zimbabwe has said that. And the Tanzanian the president is the head of the uh, SADC delegation has said, with thinking about pulling out of CITES, well, think, think. Do you pull out of CITES or do you use CITES? How do you link CITES to the WTO? How do you link it to CBD? Or maybe it's past its sell-by date and they just have to do a Trump and leave it. You know, we can see. I mean, my country pulled out of the climate stuff and, you know, it's surviving. You know, you can carry on. So 
we think that maybe one way to look at this is that the World Conservation Strategy 2.0 is what we're now calling the wildlife economy. So back in 1980, conservation, again, is the management of human use of the biosphere so that it may yield the greatest sustainable benefit. Today, we're thinking wildlife economy utilizes undomesticated animals and plants and the ecosystems which they live to produce goods and services for human benefit. So that's our working definition of a wildlife economy. And then it links the sustainable development goals. 14 and 15 on the bottom there have to do with marine and terrestrial. 12 is on sustainable production and consumption. Eight is on economic growth. And one, of course, is on poverty alleviation. So what we used to call conservation and those of us from that generation would think met what's on the left, we have to use a different language now because people think conservation means national parks and protection. So now let's try the language wildlife economy. So that's where the, the language is, is coming from now. And so we then would say wildlife conservation for economic development, conservation as a capital asset, wildlife is a capital asset that we can utilize. We can look at the animals, we can eat the animals, we can shoot the animals, we can breed up the animals, whatever, and make money out of them, create jobs out of them, and so on and so forth. And of course, this country, South Africa, and your neighbor just north of here in Namibia are two of the countries that are sort of stepping out and trying to figure out how to do that. So. What we describe now at the Institute is our vision is a vision of a world in which wildlife management, production, utilization, and trade supports inclusive, sustainable development. And I'd say maybe the key word right now that I'm in interested in is the word production. People are talking a lot about how we're losing our wildlife and loss of biodiversity. Well, if there's a demand for the product, why don't we produce more? If there's a demand for wine, we produce more wine. If there's a demand for ostrich meat, produce more ostrich meat. And in this country, even with rhinos, you've been able to, there are people that have proven that you can produce more rhinos. And if you could sell the product, you'd be encouraged to produce even more rhinos. So instead of having chicken farms between here and Durbanville, we could have rhino farms, and which would be fine. They used to live here. They didn't used to live in the Kruger, but they used to live down here. So we could do that. So the, the idea of looking at wildlife from the lens of an agri-sciences department in Stellenbosch, I think is really quite cool. And I'll end with this, is that what we can learn from in Stellenbosch is the wine economy. The wildlife economy can learn from what's right around here. My wife went to law school here, and so she said she drank her way through university like you do at this university. But if you look at this wine economy, we all consume it. We don't just look at the grapes. We also drink it. But we also go for walks there. We go for bicycle trails. We get married there. We get massages there. We eat some biltong there. We, do, you know, we have parties there. We have birthdays there. The wine economy around this town is an amazing economy, all based around a little bit of nature which is a grape. If we can do that with a grape, why can't we do it with an elephant? Same thing. Okay, I'll stop there. Okay. Thanks, thank you very much. That was okay, 30 minutes. Yeah, that's great. I mean, that's well um, we, uh, I'd say many a good reputation has been lost for speaking too long. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Questions, comments, comments, interesting uh, discussion? Yes, please. That is Should I answer those quickly? Oh, okay. Because um, we could go on all afternoon with both of those. The, the South African biodiversity economy, a bit like the CBD com complexity, part of it is called the wildlife economy, and the other part is about genetic resources. So you've got objectives one and two, conservation and sustainable use, which um, Tracer, what's her name, at um, the Southern African Wildlife College, she says to me, don't 
just call it responsible use. Put it all, tourism just trashes the ecosystem. So don't think tourism's like non-consumptive use and this other stuff's consumptive. Just call it out, we're looking for responsible use, but whatever. So then the, then the third part is on genetic resources and finding, I don't know, genes that cure baldness or what have you, and that whole big spiel. So they split it into that, which is sort of a political discourse, but that's fine. The wildlife economy stuff they're doing is fabulous. It's conceptually fabulous. There's lots of challenges in this country to get this right, even to get the data right, let alone in other countries around the continent. But nonetheless, yes, that's, that's the, the, the very much used in the same language as they are. They've now just merged, what is it, um, D has become DEF, right? They don't want to call it DEF, but it's the Department of Environment, Forestry, and Fisheries, which is absolutely fabulous because now they've got a couple of divisions back in that actually use nature. So it's not just a bunch of ecologists studying the wildlife, but people that actually f cut down trees and fish. So there's also the oceans economy. So the oceans economy stuff, and I've also seen a presentation by the South African delegation at the summit last December, November in Kenya was fabulous presentation that the South Africans put on is really cool stuff. That's also wildlife economy. It's just wildlife that swims. So we have to conceptually put these things together and think about it. Then have this on there, because there's big issues, like there's issues of animal welfare. So they're very proud of their golden abalone and hermanus. And if you look at the way those animals are in these little plastic blue tanks, and if you thought, well, if I put lions in there, we'd be horrified. So the way we factory farm our fish Compared to the way we deal with our wildlife, which I'll get on to your second question, is something we have to look at. But on the other hand, what's the discourse in the fisheries? The target under the SDGs is to increase fish stocks to maximum sustainable yield. So what? So we can hunt them and eat them. So on the marine side, everybody's saying production. On the terrestrial side, we got a whole lot of people saying no trade, stop the trade, stop the demand. I mean, if I got a billion stupid customers in China that want to buy my rhino horn, I should tell them to say, great, sell them rhino horn. Maybe they'll like American baseball too. Get them to do something, you know? Get, get the product sold. So now you get into the species production versus ecosystems. One of the interesting things is if you replace cattle and crop with the diversified wildlife economy, what happens to the landscape? What happens to the trees? What happens to the birds? What happens to the vegetation? So there's a lot of anecdotal evidence that actually the ecosystems are enhanced, they're more climate resilient and so on, but it's not 100%. And one of the ones that I love is the one about what do you do about the cheetahs in Namibia because they need bigger spaces than even Namibian farms. So how do we create cat doors and the fences so these animals can run? But there's a, you've got more of an opportunity to get ecosystem values out of a wildlife managed landscape, I think, than you do out of a cattle ranch or a crop farm, I think. And so then the question is, it's not, so a wildlife ranch in Limpopo is not the wilderness of Kruger, but Kruger's not wilderness either. It's just a big managed zoo, but it could be better managed. But it's, you know, it's, it is managed with fences and everything. But both of those have more ecosystem values coming out of them than a maize field, I would think. But that has to be studied. So now we need the ecologists back. They're the ones that are going to help us with that. But yeah, and then look at those services. So you could sell the wildlife, you could sell the hunt, and you can sell the carbon credits, and you can sell the watershed protection. So ecosystem services ought to be in the market too. They're part of the wildlife economy. So it's not just about built on. Okay, this, uh, this, all right. what can or should an institute at this university do vis-a-vis -vis other things that need to be done? One of the things that's important in this one for me is that this institute ought to be 
first and foremost, a research center for impactful research. And then not just of academics from this university, those are great people to work with here, but to be a platform for academics in Shinori, in northern Zimbabwe, in Makareri, in the University of Ghana, and so on. So that we, because if you're interested in this space, there's no Department of Wildlife Economics or Wildlife Economy anywhere period. So why not create a, a platform here and engage people? So start with the research. So there's something there. Some of those people may come out of the education sector, but we're not looking at this necessarily as being an, an education program first, but getting the research done. I think if we had been more operational last year, we could have had some papers out for the CITES COP that would have helped government. Second point that's really important there is the word is African, not Southern African. And I think that that's something that there's a real need, even with the CITES thing. I was saying before the break, there's one vote that's needed to legalize the rhino trade, just one in the whole world, and that's Kenya. The Southern African countries are their own worst enemy. Ah, where's Iswatini, Zimbabwe, Namibia, well, da 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 da, we're gonna go up to Geneva, and, and then they get flattened every time. They, get, they need to talk to the rest of the continent. Everybody's on WhatsApp, the whole continent. Now the discourse is continental wide. They need to cut a deal. Kenyatta actually came out in support of opening up the elephant trade, but Kenya Wildlife Service opposed him. So the president up there wants to move, but we need the president down here and the president up there to go have a couple glasses of nice, you know, Bochendel wine or whatever, <laughs> and figure out, you know, how they're going to do this, and then tell the, us to do it. So we need to be in at this university. African focus, not the Southern African focus, and unabashedly trying to get people in from Cameroon. I've got two guys in my MBA program in Rwanda, where I'm also working, doing, setting up a wildlife farm in Rwanda as an alternative to illegal bushmeat trade. So they're going to set up a 90 hectare farm to start, get going, and they're flying down to meet the guys at Wildlife Ranch in South Africa to get some insights and so on. And that's cool. Let's do that. But yes, education's there, but we still don't even have the impactful research and the storylines to put into the curriculum. We don't have it yet. We need to build it and put it together. But if somebody came along and said, we'd like to put five million rand into you guys developing an education program, we're for sale. We'll do it. Funding's there, we'll do it. Needs to be done. My name is Barbara Nussbaum. I'm an author. I just wanted to follow up with a question. Does your institute have plans and vision to communicate with indigenous traditional ecologists? And with, yes. I, <laughs> I've only come across traditional ecologists in Zimbabwe, but my contact with them has been inspirational in the sense that their, their knowledge of um, indigenous traditional ecology is so profound. And I just wanted to ask if you have had any contact, and if you hadn't, I'm happy to introduce you. Well, what I, I sometimes say, and it's quite rude, is that the, the Institute is not open to ecologists it's, <laughs> at all, because they're the ones that screwed up the planet. Because all they did was study the animals, they didn't study us, and we're the ones that need to be studied. I joke, obviously <laughs> we need ecology. But if you mm. think about it, mm. This whole thing of science-based conservation. You imagine if you had engineering-based um, computer companies, they would never get a product to the market. You need, you know, if Steve Jobs wasn't an engineer, he was a marketing guy. What we're looking at with this institute and also what we're doing up in, in Kigali with the African Leadership University is getting people to understand the business side, the economic side, the legal side, the governance side, and so on. And yes, in that discourse, they should be listening to the ecologists and learning from them. And I agree with you, that's not just the professional ecologists, but the people on the ground. What they're doing at African Parks, which is one of the really interesting organizations in this business, is doing at Akagira, the national park that they run in Rwanda, is they're hiring local people based on local ecological knowledge to do the game drives. And we had this young girl from the local village doing our game drive. Oh, God, she was great, fabulous. I mean, you know, it was this great marketing, but also she told you things different than bringing a scientist in from, say, um, you know, George from here, from Stellenbosch. And, uh, so yes, we, but what we, we should be doing as an institute is pulling in, so on this campus, it's agri-sciences, animal sciences, it's agriculture economics, it's the law faculty, it's the business school, it's the school of public leadership, it's the economics department, it's also philosophy and sociology. So our first area of discourse is, what is the ethical context for the wildlife economy? Do you eat wild meat? 
And if so, what type? The East Africans don't eat warthog. They don't eat pork. The Southern Africans don't eat zebra. They don't eat giraffe. The West Africans eat monkey. Well, I, oh. okay, I don't. Um, but I do eat zebra and giraffe. And so you get into, so we need sociologists, philosophers, economists, lawyers complementing all the actual science work that is both in formal education and traditional ecology. And Thank that's you. what this institute's trying to look at, the business side, if you will. Thank you. Okay, well, there's two questions about trade. From an ecology viewpoint, or say, from a, is the trade sustainable, whether it's legal or illegal? And then there's a question of whether it, from a political or legal viewpoint, is it allowable? So that I can give you an example of extensive illegal trade that is totally sustainable in the meat and fish industry, and that's the border between France and Switzerland. I lived there for the last 25 years. I've just done a Frexit and moved to the UK, um, hoping the UK can get out of the empire, but that's another lecture. Um, the, uh, but I lived in France. There was massive amounts of illegal trade between Switzerland and France on chicken, fish, cheese, milk, dairy products of all sites, because the French groceries are 30% cheaper than the Swiss groceries. They're not running out of chickens and pigs because of all this illegal trade. In fact, they produce more because there's a market for them. So, but it's, you know, it's, it is illegal. You have to declare it and they don't declare it and they take too much. We all do it. Every, I do it the other way around when I was living in France because the VAT, the tax is low in Switzerland. So you buy your computers and your TVs there and you come to the border. This is lessons for the Irish border. You come to the border with two cars and I've got the TV in the back car and my wife's in the front car and she WhatsApp me and says, the border guards aren't there, let's go. And we bring the TV in. It works all the time. We all do that at this mess. So, is the trade sustainable? Is it ethical? There's a lot of science people worried about the illegal trade. And they say, if, if Zimbabwe opened up the trade in rhino horn, then it'll encourage more illegal trade. Well, one has to ask, first of all, will it, how will it, how do you manage this, how do you manage these two? Now, there's places you can look at. You look at the old, making alcohol illegal in the states and what did we learn from that the prohibition and right now i think an interesting study if i was in looking at illegal trade is the legalization of marijuana in some of the states in america so some states it's legal and other states it isn't so what's happening to the legal trade in the states where marijuana is still illegal vis-a-vis -vis the states where it's legal what i've heard the evidence is that the illegal trade's going down so why bother with the illegal trade, which is less transparent, less accountable, if you can just buy the stuff across the border legally? And so we're seeing the illegal trade, what do you call it, overriding the illegal trade, taking it out. Here, if you opened up rhino horn and you're able to sell this stuff to the Chinese, I mean, nobody locally wants to buy a rhino horn, but you've got a lot of customers over there. I bet you there would be stacks of these guys up in Limpopo investing like mad to produce more rhinos. So yeah, there'd be still some illegal trade, just like we have illegal trade between Switzerland and France, but the production system would come up and boom, the stuff would just get, get going, you know? Is it gonna not be produced quick enough and then all of a sudden all the stocks are wiped out? Well, that's why we have animal prisons in the US and Europe called zoos, where we lock up all these species and keep them locked up all the time. So we've got the stock. We just have to get the stock on the ground. You've got, it's the same issue. I mean, you've, with the abalone and stuff, you've got to get the legal stuff going, stop the illegal harvesting. It's, it, it, and you have to, this is where an institute like this, get people that are lawyers and people that are marketing, figuring out how to, to work that. It isn't something that is always easy, easy, but it has to be addressed. And I think, Legal trade is one way to, one aspect of how to address illegal trade, create a legal opportunity, which is what the Golden Abalone folks say. Is that what it's called, Golden Abalone down in Hermanus are doing? You know, neat project. So I want to ask about, I want to ask about the issue of 
when you commented and said production of wildlife, and we have already tested the downside of in situ con conservation or the breeding of lions and all those things. So are you recommending that we should go on and breed lions and breed rhinos and all those things? Is that what you said? <laughs> Let me end with the, the sort of economic thinking on lion breeding, because that's a nice controversial one. So you guys, you've got an industry down here where people breed up lions and they put them into some reserve and they walk around for a few days and some American comes in and shoots them, okay? So what I did last year is I went to the Wildlife Ranch in South Africa conference up in Polokwane and I presented a manual to these guys. And it's the Lion Care Manual, 150 pages, how to breed up lions. And who's it from? The American Zoological Association. So what do they do? I call it put in prison, what they do, as opposed to put and take. So what they do in Europe and North America is they breed up lions and put them in a prison for their whole life. Down here, they breed up lions, they get to walk around for a week, and then they get shot. So I don't know if you like life sentences or capital punishment, but they're, it's, first question is, how do you breed them up? And it's a question of standards, whether it's like the abalone and so on. So I said to the guys up in Limpopo, I said, if you guys can have at least the quality of standards that the Americans and the Europeans have in your production facility, then you can come back and say, you may not like what we do with our product, but at least we're producing it according to world-class standards of how you breed up a lion. So that's the first question, is breeding practices and what's acceptable and how do you get it right and so on. The second question then is, well, here you've developed an industry around getting my country, Chinese like horn, my country likes to kill things. You know, Americans like to kill, they kill their kids, they kill anything, you know, it's terrible. So I mean, so this country can make a lot of money out of Americans who like to come and kill things. I don't kill, I, I'm, I'm a wimp. I mean, I like to eat the animals, but I don't want to kill them, I'm, I'm too squeamish. I could never have worked in your department, it's just too much, you know, I want it on the table cooked. And, uh, but whatever. The, um, so what happens here is you've got a rancher in Limpopo, northwest, and he's got 5,000 hectares, and he's got his buffalo and his kudu, and the, the hunt comes in, they said, I want a buffalo and a kudu and a zebra and a lion. So then he buys the lion in, drops him off, right? That lion then allows that guy to have 5,000 hectares converted from cattle to wildlife. It allows the whole industry to develop. It has ecological implications because now you've replaced cattle ranching with stuff. So you can see the lion is sort of like the savior of the ecology. So instead of demonizing this canned lion, heroize them. This is the one that is the species that's making the economy work. And taking that one, taking that bread lion out of the equation ruins a lot of the economy. So the first thing to do is get the humane side of it right. And then secondly, look at its role in maintaining these landscapes. It allows these people to come in. Now, I think what we should be doing, and this then ties in with the black, white, and the inclusive, and the empowerment, and all that stuff. Those guys with their 5,000 hectare farms up there need to start becoming cooperatives and put 10 of them together, get 50,000, then you can create a lion herd in there. When you have two small properties, you can't have the predators in there. I'm not the ecologist, but you need a bigger space to have the lions in there. And then with that bigger space, you can then have share ownership with your workers and then turn it from a you know, pot-bellied white guys to black guys running the thing and on you go. So you can do a sort of ecology, economic transformation in which you then sort of replace some of the lion breeding with indigenous herds and bigger landscapes. That can all be thought about, but at this stage of the growth of the industry, I think your lion breeding is a really key thing that has helped to conserve a lot of wildlife on the continent. Poor lions get shot, but it, it's created a lot more wildlife and a lot more wil wilderness. There you go. How's that? Well, thanks very much. Okay, thank you guys. Thank you.